They're smiling. They're happy. So I've got to cheer up and be happy. Next time you're alone, even, even do it, do this alone or with a crowd. Next time you're feeling down and low, simply smile. And all of a sudden, everything improves because you just tricked your brain into being happy. And that's the way to have happiness. If you'll notice, the other four bodhisattvas up there, they have a little faint smile on their face. But Maitreya, man, he's grinning from ear to ear. You, you can see his teeth. He brushes with Colgate toothpaste twice a day. So brush your teeth with Colgate. <laughs> Colgate pays me to say that. <laughs> now then, let's move on down to the next one. Oh, and the reason he has the big tummy, the big tummy in Chinese, the Chinese Buddha, the Chinese Mitra has a big tummy, it's because he has a big heart, represents his big heart. Now, the next one here, the, uh, the, you're going to like this one, this one's female. Her name is Abelakai Teshvara. That's a mouthful. Chinese, her name is Kuan Yin. Kuan Yin's a bodhisattva of the great, great compassion. When she was about to enter nirvana, she noticed all the people that were suffering in the world. So she took a vow that she would stay here and help them out of their suffering. Okay. Later on today in the museum, you're going to see a picture, a statue rather, a statue of her with many arms. Another statue, she has a thousand hands. This represents she can help a lot of people at the same time. Okay. Now let's move on down to the, the next one. This one up here, the last one down here, his name is Manjusri Bodhisattva. Manjusri Bodhisattva is the Bodhisattva of great wisdom. Now then the big question, how many here would like to have great wisdom? How many people here would like to find out it's easier to pass a test? I'm going to give you the secret. Okay. You take your knowledge and your education and your experience and you think about them. In other words, we like to say you meditate about them. And through meditation, you can turn your knowledge, experience, and education into wisdom that you can use. It's that simple. If you have a, a method of, of, of uh, meditation right now, you'll understand what I mean. If you don't, find one. Practice it for 10 minutes a day. It has to have nothing to do with any religious beliefs. It's learning how to use your mind in a special way. And you'll find that it does get rid of stress. Or if you don't have one, next time you're on Google, simply Google in meditation. 60 million hits will pop up in, within two seconds. You can get on YouTube and YouTube will let you learn how to meditate from a professional teacher with a movie. Find yourself a method of meditation and use it. I was fortunate enough to find out about meditation when I was in college. And after that, when I took a test, I used to feel like I was cheating because it was so easy through learning how to use your mind, how to remember what the textbook said, how to remember how the le lectures of your teacher were, and find yourself one. Now then, the Bodhisattva of great wisdom and the Bodhisattva of, of great compassion, it's not an accident that they're side by side. Because without compassion, wisdom is no good. And without wisdom, compassion is no good. I'll give you an example. You're standing on a street corner and a homeless man comes up to you and, oh, he smells like he's been drinking alcohol. And he asks you for a dollar. Well, now, you know, if you give him a dollar, he's only going to use it to buy more alcohol and, and further pollute his mind. So you say, no, I, I won't give you a dollar, but if you come across the street to McDonald's here, I'll buy you a cup of coffee and a hamburger. One will help him, the other one will harm him. So we have to use wisdom with our compassion. Now, on the wall here, the backboard the, behind me, and all the way down to the end of the room, the, the Chinese writing there is one of the teachings of Buddha. We call them a sutra. We refer to this one as the Diamond Sutra. It's most important and it's really important in Buddhism. Now then, 
As you all know, the diamond's the hardest stone. It cuts all other stones. So we say that the Diamond Sutra helps us cut ignorance out of our lives. In this, the Buddha teaches that life is short. He teaches it's like a, a bolt of thunder, uh, a, a flash of lightning, a shadow, a bubble. It's here for a short time and then it vanishes away. So we need to use it in as quickly as we can. He also teaches us in this that, that life's an illusion. We just think it's real. We think it goes on forever, but it doesn't. It ends. Okay. Now then, directly below it, and all the way across the room, the altar, the things that are on the altar, these are gifts we give to the temple. Okay. Now then, if you're here on a Sunday afternoon, it's all covered with gifts because Sunday's the day that most people come to the temple. Okay. Now then, we have a list of things we give to the temple as gifts. One of the strange things when I first started coming here was they never, at the classes I was attending or the, uh, the services I was attending, they never passed a collection plate. Never took up a collection. If you want to donate money, this box right over there has a slot in the top. It says a contribution. You can put it in there. There's also one up in the other shrine. Okay. We think in Buddhism it's more important to donate your time than it is to donate your money. Anybody can reach in their pocket and take out money, but you got to really care in order to volunteer your time and, and give your time. Everyone you're going to see working here today in the temple is a volunteer. Okay. If you have lunch in our dining room, all the people in the dining room are volunteers. Okay. So these are people that care enough to give their time. Now, you can bring your gift from home or you can, I'll show you a thing we do and I'll, I'll show you what the gifts are. One of the ways you can donate is you can come in here, go to this lady over here, and you can purchase one of these. Okay, you put it on the altar and you go about your business in the altar, then, about the business in the temple, then when you're finished, if you'd like to take it home for your own personal use, you take it over there, she'll bag it up, and you can take it home. Okay, now then, there's certain things in here that we say that we are give as gifts to the temple. Number one, this is incense. Incense, well, we say it, it, it makes you have a clear mind because when you breathe in real deep, it makes you feel good, okay? Unless you've got sinus problems. <laughs> now then, another thing that we have here is tea. It's another gift we bring to the temple. Uh, tea, usually if you're gonna have a cup of tea, you're gonna sit down with, it's usually with a friend and have a cup of tea and relax, okay? Uh, one other thing, and one of the things we let very, is very important in Buddhism, a candle. As I, I think I said before, we let light represent wisdom. Okay. I can take this small candle. I can walk, light this candle. I can walk into a cave that's been dark for a million years. And the light of this one small candle will push back that darkness of a million years. This shows us that each individual person in the world is important. Okay. We all have our mission to fulfill in this world. Okay. And we use the light of the candle to let us remind us of that. Okay. There's flowers. Flowers bring beauty into our lives. And the flowers you're going to see today in the temple are real. Okay. Uh, there's fruit. Fruit's good for our health. Uh, this represents food, crackers. Uh, food, of course, is necessary. That's another donation we make to the temple. Uh, and one last donation I talk about is candy. I like to say candy keeps us all sweet. All right. Now then, you put it back over here. You can leave it here or you can take it home. If you leave it on the altar, then we recycle it. Okay. The, if you eat in the, in, the, in the dining room, most of the fruit you will eat there has been here on the altar before, a donation. Questions? Yes. What are all these um, plaques on the wall? Are they all like different people? 
Okay, all right. See, they're all Buddha. Okay, if you're standing where you can tell, they all have the same face. Okay, uh, they represent a couple of different things. Number one, when we get when you go to see the main shrine today, we have three big Buddhas there, and they all have the same face also. Uh, Buddha, when he was alive, taught us that the same uh, spirit that he had inside him, or we call it an essence, the same essence he had inside him, we have inside of us. Okay? And so that means that we all look like Buddhas. Buddha told, tells us that we all someday be a Buddha. Okay? Now then, if we look like Buddha, we have to give Buddha our face. So on the statues you see, you give the Buddha your face. Buddha looks like you, Buddha looks like you, Buddha looks like you. Okay? He is inside of all of us who are teaching. Now then, while we're on the subject right here, I like to tell people this real quickly. Number one, we teach you very quickly uh, that Buddha's dead. Buddha's been dead for over 2,500 years. Once when he was uh, alive, a group of his disciples were with him. One of them asked him, said, are you a god? And he said, no. He said, well, are you a messenger from God? And he said, no. He said, well, then what are you? He said, I'm awake. He had, he had awakened to what life is really about. Okay. And the word Buddha simply means the awakened one. So we tell people very quick that Buddha is no longer here. Buddha also taught us that, uh, while he was here, that out in our universe, there are billions and billions of other Buddha worlds. Okay, we are other worlds. We call them Buddha worlds now. He didn't call them Buddha worlds. We call them Buddha worlds now. And so if there's that, billions and billions of other Buddha worlds have to be billions and billions of other Buddhas. That's one of the things this represents. Also, modern science and the Buddha teachings are coming closer together. 2,500 years ago, he taught us about billions of other, other, other planets out there, other galaxies, rather. And Hubble telescopes now tell us that's true. There are billions and billions of other worlds out there, other galaxies. So what Buddha taught and what the scientists know now is coming closer together. Now then, the last thing i like to cover before we leave here is you will see people coming in, and they'll be doing a half bow to the statue Okay, or in the main shrine, which is being occupied right now, the main shrine, they'll be doing a, a bow to the Buddhas. What we're doing when we're bowing to the Buddha or these either, we're paying respect to what the Buddha taught. We don't worship idols. The same as you, if, if you're Catholic and you're, you're, uh, you're praying to Mary, you're not worshiping that statue, you're worshiping what she represents. Okay, and the same as us. And the Buddha taught us that we all have the same nature inside of us that he did. So what we really say is when we're bowing to the Buddha, we're bowing to ourselves. Okay. Now, you'll see people come in and they'll do a full bow, or we call it a prostration. Now, fortunately in America, we get to use the kneeling stools. <laughs> if you were in our, 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 one of our temples in China, you'd be kneeling on like a little carpet about this thick. But we're softer in America. Okay. Now then... What we're doing when we're doing a prostration, we are showing, we're, we're showing uh, humility. One of the biggest, uh, if not the biggest obstacle you will have in your whole life that will give you more trouble than anything else is your own ego. Our egos get us into more and more trouble. So we need to learn to control that ego. And it's hard to have a big ego when you're prostrated on the floor showing humility. So when you see someone doing a full bow, we're showing humility. Everybody watch out for this guy here. He, he bit two people last week. <laughs> that usually gets a chuckle. <laughs> this is what a typical garden might look like in the forest. We have the crane back here the deer over here, the little creatures on the ground, and the little, the little men statues there, they're called novice monks. Okay. And then we have the gold ox. Okay, the gold ox, three years ago, Chinese give each year a different animal. It was the year of the ox. 
The year after that was the year of the tiger. Now, we didn't put a tiger out here because we were afraid he'd eat the little guys. So this year after the ox was the year of the rabbit. And this is the year of the, of the uh, dragon. And the dragon stands for courage and for uh, wisdom in Chinese. Okay. Now then, the little guys. Talk about those. They represent novice monks. China is a little bit different than we are here with our society. They tell me that outside the big cities, there's abject poverty. In fact, in China, there's still a lot of, a lot of places they won't let outsiders go to because they don't want you to see how people live there. A child of six years old might enter into a monastery to become a monk or nun. Or he might be there because his parents couldn't, couldn't feed him anymore. Or an orphan. So that happens. Our master, who is also the founder of our temples, he's now 84 years old. He uh, has been a monk since he was 12. And we're fortunate he can still travel. They tell me he's in town today. He can still travel at, at 84 years old, which is very nice. Now, the little guys, they represent, now, the little guy back there, he's in a meditation position. The guy over here is meditating. Now, the little guy here laying on the book, now, he's studying. Now, I'm going to give you a big secret that people don't know. If you have a book that you want to know what's inside of it, at nighttime, when you go to bed, put it beneath your pillow. While you're asleep, the knowledge in the book will mysteriously enter into your head. How many believe that? <laughs> how many would like to believe that? <laughs> that? That's how I got through college. Maybe that's what it took eight years. <laughs> okay, right this way. Try not to stand under it. It fell twice last year. Did it? See, you're starting to believe me. <laughs> no, <laughs> but it sounds good. Everybody backs up. <laughs> okay, if you'll notice at the other end of the hall, there is a, a drum, a big drum hanging in the same place. If you, we are a monastic society here. Monks and nuns take care of the temple for us. Okay, now if you're a monk or nun here, uh, well, maybe not here, but if you're saying in Taiwan, at 5.30 in the morning, they ring that bell. That means it's time to get up and start your day, if you're a monk or nun. And at 10.30, they beat the drum. That means it's time to go to bed. I figure so we can get up in the morning when they ring this at 5.30. Now, we don't ring it for this temple. We use it in special ceremonies, and I can tell you, it's real loud. If we try to hear all the neighbors around, we get upset and complain when we woke them up at 5.30. The temple is ran by monks and nuns. They live here in the temple grounds or in the houses around the temple. They, uh, they uh, all take celibacy vows. They don't get married. They take poverty vows. They, they don't get paid. They get a small strip in each month. Uh, to, for personal needs like toothbrush, toothpaste, and I tell them about Colgate. <laughs> so we, uh, we have them living here. Now then, the little one that walked up to me a while ago, you saw her, okay, she has two of the robes, like, well, part of it was her, her, her robe for a special ceremony, but they got regular orange, they call them chiffon, I think, some uh, robes that they wear. They own two of those robes. One they wear today while they wash the other one, the, and they'll wash this one they wore today, tomorrow, and wear it the next day. So they uh, are required, if they don't have a college degree, to have continuing education. Okay. Uh, most of them here have a master's degree at least, uh, or at least a bachelor. The nun that used, I call her the little nun because she's the shortest one around. Uh, she has two master's degrees. Okay. Now then, several of them teach in the colleges around here. Uh, one of them teaches at Mount San Antonio College in Pomona, and another at Cal Poly over in Pomona. Several of them teach at our college. And uh, so they're very well educated, very well capable of doing it. In fact, one of the, one of the nuns here has a, a doctor's degree from Harvard. So they're very, they also seem to me, because I've known most of them for nine years, they seem to be very happy with their job. 
They work seven days a week. Uh, it's not in their contract to get a day off. So they work seven days a week. And like I say, they seem to be very happy. Now then, one of the things they do, and I, this, this was told to me by a nun, and I like to tell it to you because you're all females, okay? When a nun takes her final vows and becomes an ordained nun, she has to take 249 vows. When a monk takes vows, he has to take 175. 